Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today I will be talking about bowls. Yes, so bowls. And why they are important in Southeast Asia. So to begin, bowls, as in many cultures, are important as vessels to contain food. Although in Southeast Asia, we don't necessarily use bowls to put our food in it as most of the time uh, food, especially rice, can be eaten on um, banana leaves or even um, metal plates. So really, bowls have a more different function in Southeast Asia. So, in case you're wondering, um, this is actually a rice basket uh, from Burma. And as you can see from the um, writing on um, the casing, um, I'll speak about this for another time. But I thought it'd be interesting because we always associate um, rice in Asia with bowls, but actually, um, a lot of uh, parts of Southeast Asia we don't actually use utensils to eat. In fact, we use our hands um, to eat. So, what do people in Southeast Asia use bowls for? Let's see. So to start off, um, here is a bowl that many of you might recognize as um, a Tibetan singing bowl. So although it's called a Tibetan singing bowl, it's not only found in Tibet, but um, it, also, it is also found in Myanmar, uh, in Thailand, uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. And I believe this one, uh, we had gotten it from uh, Myanmar, um, maybe in 2012, when it first just opened its doors. So, why is it called a singing bowl, right? So for those of you who can read, um, I believe these are probably San Sanskrit. <clears throat> it's a singing bowl because of the sound it makes. Um, so I'm just going to try and play it for you. So let's see. The sound gets loud. So it really works with vibrations, which is why the sound gets louder and louder, although I'm not actually hitting it at all. So this one in particular is made up of um, brass, if I'm not wrong, and as well as copper. And um, so what's really beautiful inside is that we can see there is a lotus motif right inside here. Right, and um, as you know in Buddhism, lotus is a very important motif. So this is actually my second singing bowl. I seem to have lost my first one. Um, it was bought for me when I was 18. That was the first time I was introduced to Buddhism and um, perhaps I had left it back um, in my house uh, where my parents live and I didn't bring it over <laughs> with me when I moved out. But I think that you can also put water inside and um, you know play it. So the whole idea of the singing bowl is that it's for meditation and you know the more you play the, so the sound, the more you feel at peace and tranquil, which is I guess kind of what Buddhism tries to um, impart to its believers. Okay, so the next bowl that I have is also from Myanmar. So this bowl is slightly, well, well you know, it's, it's had its use um, in its life. And I originally did not want to buy this bowl because of how kind of terrible it looks. As you can see, it has like dents and it's got like paint all over it. So this bowl is, well, it's not actually meant for food. Um, it's actually meant for offerings. So um, you probably see them um, at temples. So they would put, um, you know, joysticks inside and probably for prayers. Um, and which is why I think there are all these marks. So for this one, this is definitely made out of brass or copper because it's very um, malleable. Um, it's easy to bend um, and really, really light. So unlike this one, which is really, really heavy. Um, so something really, I suppose, interesting about this bowl is that there are no um, human or, fig or animal uh, motifs on it. In fact, the only sort of etching you can see are that of flowers, yeah. So I had to do a bit of research to see what the kind of flowers are found on this particular bowl because um, 
and they don't look particularly like the lotus because the lotus is kind of like blooming like this and sometimes the lotus is also represented by um, eight points right but in here we only have let me, see, let me show you an example yep so here we only have um, flower motifs with three points so um, it seems that this kind of flower motifs are quite commonly found on the temple on the vast reliefs of uh, Pagan so if you're there and you happen to look at it um, those are some of the flowers they could probably be um, they could possibly still be lotuses but from an angle so speaking of flowers they are a very important motif in a lot of um, Southeast Asian items and you know um, even across to South Asia and even China. So here I have another bowl with a floral motif. So as you can see, it is definitely a flower and it's one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a six petal flower. So not a lotus. So hmm, not really sure what flower it is. But if you had to warn a guess, where do you think this is from? Right? So, so perhaps some of you had seen the writings here, and yes, these are in Arabic. But this bowl, um, very interestingly, what I really liked about it is how irregular it is. So it's definitely handmade. And me, when I buy ceramics or pottery, I always prefer that they are handmade and hand painted because you know that somebody actually took the time and the effort to make these bowls and therefore they have more meaning and also more um, history to it. So this bowl is not an ancient bowl and in fact it does not come from Southeast Asia. It is actually made in Pakistan. Okay. But I wanted to just uh, show you how um, the colours inside also kind of represent um, certain themes that are in ceramics or pottery from China. And in particular, if you look um, on the colour blue, right? So perhaps you're more familiar with um, pottery that has white and blue from the Tang Dynasty uh, because the Yuan Dynasty or the Song Dynasty, they have more green in them. So you know, cobalt blue, which is this colour here, this colour, yeah, this colour, it's not actually native to Southeast Asia at all, or even China. So this cobalt blue actually came from the Middle East. So it is much more likely that um, Pakistani um, pottery makers would have used them first before China. Although with trading, you know, that's how um, the blue dye actually went all the way to China, and that's how they managed to produce such beautiful ceramics. So for this bowl, um, it's mainly a decorative piece, if I could say. Um, you could put things in them, but um, it's really meant just for decoration. But I thought that I just put them here to sh kind of show you that bowls in this part of the world does not necessarily have um, a function that we sort of associate them with. So there you have it, a really, really quick um, introduction to bowls that can be found in Southeast Asia and Asia in general. So um, the whole point of showing the bowls today is um, to give you an idea that um, not every bowl you see is actually used for eating. And this is very important, especially when you go into temples and you see a bowl, um, sometimes that bowl is really sacred, such as the cinnamon bowl. So you have to be very careful not to just touch them or, you know, play around with them. Um, and similarly, um, as with this decorative bowl, it can be decorative, but um, when you put um, Arabic words on them, sometimes they can be part of prayers, uh, so sometimes they can be part of the Quran, and that's also seen as sacred. Um, so this idea of sacredness in objects is something that I find um, very common in Southeast Asia. So even things as um, simple as this container to cook rice can be really sacred. So um, it's probably not, well this is probably not the best example, but um, in Indonesia, in Toraja for example, um, they have motifs of oxes guarding the granary door and that's because the ox is seen as um, a kind of a protector 
and also a helper, right? Because the ox works on the fields. And um, there's this sort of sacredness that's attached to items. And there's something really, really unique in Southeast Asia. So I hope that you've enjoyed today's little um, sharing session of the bowls that I have in my possession. And I hope that you look forward to more sharing of um, antiques that I have at home. Till next time, bye!